welcome to Fairfax House. My name is Dr Sarah Burnage and I'm the curator here and today I want to welcome you to the first in our digital series of curator talks where we take one object from our amazing collections and explore its fascinating history. Today I want to focus on this sumptuous and enigmatic painting. It's known to us as Woman with Doves by William Etty and was bequeathed to York Civic Trust by Noel Terry. William Etty was a York-born artist who was famous in the Victorian period for his depictions of the nude. Whilst an established figure, being made a Royal Academician before his now more famous contemporary John Constable, Etty and his art courted controversy throughout his career because of his sustained meditation and focus on the nude in his art. Noel Terry has often been described as having rather conservative taste when it came to collecting paintings and certainly the majority of the works he acquired tended to be landscapes, mostly Dutch in origin from the 17th century, or small domestic vignettes. The only 19th century paintings he did collect were those ascribed to William Etty, and all of them included the nude. It seems likely Noel Terry bought Woman with Doves, stepping out of his comfort zone, because of Etty's strong connections to York. Indeed, Etty's passionate defence of the city's medieval walls and his successful attempts to stop their destruction when the railway came to the city perhaps struck a chord with Noel Terry's own post-World War II desire to preserve York's architectural heritage. It also seems likely that Noel Terry purchased this picture because he simply liked it. The sentimental narrative and beauty of the sitter making it an attractive work to hang in his home at Goddard's. This beautiful painting has passed as work by William Etty for at least the last 80 years or so, arousing little if any suspicions. Certainly, the painting is consistent with Etty's style and choice of subject matter. A young, partially dressed woman in a sentimental scene which at once offers to titillate the viewer whilst also legitimising the flesh on display are all classic hallmarks of Etty's work. The application of paint is also comparable, having a loose and light quality which gives the impression of fluidity. The haircut the young woman sports is consistent with the late 1840s when Etty was painting and the work is unsigned, something again which is consistent with Etty's work. The artist hardly ever signed his work. In fact, a signature on a work by Etty often raises suspicions as he so rarely used them. And yet a few things have always niggled me about this painting. For starters, works of this size and type produced by Etty tend to be created on millboard. Millboard enabled the artist to apply the paint more fluidly than had he used canvas. The other kind of aspect to this painting that made me a little concerned, if we look closely at the surface of the work, it has many of the characteristics of Etty's style. However, the paint is applied very thinly and we don't get those characteristic little blobs of white paint to highlight a work which Etty used. Finally, when looking through the records relating to Etty's works which he exhibited publicly, I can find no record of this work being exhibited. Now that isn't necessarily a red flag, Etty produced lots of works which weren't publicly exhibited. But at the same time, Etty regularly exhibited works at the Royal Academy and at the British Institution and at regional galleries, so you'd imagine that this work may have appeared at some point in time. And yet, these things alone weren't enough to convince me that the original attribution wasn't correct. After all, who was I to argue with 80 years of professional scrutiny? That was until we received an email from Art UK, who had been contacted by a man in Russia who was able to definitively attribute the work not to Etty, but rather to the later Victorian artist James Santare. In his letter, this observant gentleman noted that his mother had a print of the painting, which very clearly attributed the work to James Sant, giving it a date of around 1861 and its original title, Emblems of Love. To my shame, the name James Sant didn't immediately register with me. He is rarely mentioned amongst the big hitters of the Victorian period, like Millet, Rossetti, Tadamer, Leighton, Watts, etc. However, he was staggeringly successful in his time, exhibiting over 200 works at the Royal Academy alone between 1840 and his death in 1915. That's over 70 years of active artistic production. As well as being appointed in 1871 as Principal Painter in Ordinary, that's the official portraitist to Queen Victoria. Perhaps the reason for Sant's general admission from the annals of the 19th century is because his career, as it progressed, tended to focus on portraiture, especially society portraiture, which was viewed with suspicion by some in the period. 
because it was believed to lack imagination, lack creativity, and therefore lack intellectual rigour, or, as some may have put it at the time, being a mere imitation of nature. However, a quick scan through the many, many works he sent for exhibition at the Royal Academy suggests that he was also producing a substantial number of what might, we might term allegorical works, as well as some history and biblical paintings. The titles of such works, such as Contemplation, Light and Shade, Floral Offerings and Childhood, to name just a few, give you an indication of the type of other works he presented for public approbation. Emblems of Love certainly fits into the category of allegorical. Here the viewer is asked to closely observe a young semi-clad woman and her doves. Doves are often associated in the Christian tradition with the Holy Spirit. However, here it seems more likely that Santa is using them for their affiliation with the goddess Aphrodite, or Venus as she later became. The association with Venus is made explicit through Sant's portrayal of the woman's naked flesh and the indication that her robes are just about to fall off. The textures also add to the painting's sensual appeal. The smooth, unblemished display of flesh together with the soft feathers of the birds which intimately press against her bosom seem purposefully designed to titillate the viewer. However, the woman's expression suggests something more complex and ambivalent than this. She appears to be more than just Victorian eye candy. Indeed, Sant does not show the woman coyly encouraging an eroticised gaze. Rather, her expression downwards towards the dust suggests she is contemplating something much more profound. Perhaps about the nature of love, maybe about the loss of her innocence, a longing for love, or we can even imagine unrequited love. This makes a painting so much more than simply a sensual nude study. Rather, the subtle use of gesture and expression gives the painting substantial emotional depth, which helps to distance and elevate its meaning. This subtle way of justifying the nude in art nicely brings us back to William Etty, who was the undoubted master at ensuring his depictions of the nude passed the eagle eyes of the censors. Indeed, when seen together, Sant's painting appears remarkably similar to some of the many wistful head and shoulder studies Etty produced towards the end of his career. I can find no direct evidence that James Sant ever sought to directly emulate the art of William Etty. Sant was starting his career in 1840, just as William Etty was coming to the end of his career at the same time. However, we know that William Etty, despite being an elderly gentleman well established in his career, continued to attend the Royal Academy Life School throughout his life. And it's possible to imagine that Sant may have met Etty at the studios and gained inspiration from this senior artist. Equally, we know that Etty, in the 1840s, was very successful commercially with paintings very much like this. Allegorical figures of women, nudes, did generate money for the artist, and Sam may have seen an opportunity to develop his own professional career as well as his career financially as an artist. In many ways, we're right at the very start of our journey learning more about this painting, how it came into Noel Terry's collection, and how the misattribution to William Etty came about. As we delve into the archives and study the painting more, I'm sure we'll be able to share this information with you in the future. In the meantime, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, for our very first curator talk here at Fairfax House. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. We'd love to hear from you if you've got any questions or comments, so please be in touch. Until next time, bye-bye.